Hey, what's up, A-Push Kids? We're back for our next lecture in AP U.S. History, Topic 4.4, Politics and Regional Interest. Our learning objective today is 4C, explain how different regional interests affected debates about the role of the federal government in the early republic. Leading us into key idea number one, plans to further unify the U.S. economy, such as the American system, generated debates over whether such policies would benefit agriculture or industry, potentially favoring different sections of the country. So it kind of goes to that idea of the different regional interests. So to help us kind of understand everything, let's get a little bit of the context of kind of what's going on. So we're going to be looking really at the presidency of James Monroe. Now, he was elected pretty much overwhelmingly as president in both 1816 and in 1820. And the reason for this um, stems from what we talked about last time, and that was the Hartford Convention. Hartford Convention was really going to end the Federalist Party. They pretty much disintegrate as a political party. And as such, what's going to happen is that there's really nobody that's really going to be able to go against Monroe. The Federalists are there in 1816, but as you can see on the map, they're just really not going to be a political force. And they're not even there uh, in, in the election of 1820. In fact, Monroe wins re-election in 1820 by pretty much a unanimous vote. There's one rogue elector in New Hampshire that votes for John Quincy Adams. Everybody else votes for James Monroe. And because of this, because of the fact that we have very little political party discord at this particular time, at least publicly, uh, and this increased nationalism after the War of 1812, this era of James Monroe is known as the era of good feelings, lasts basically from 1850 all the way until 1825. Now, the big thing that we're going to really see here is this concept of nationalism and American unity. And Monroe and the Republicans in Congress are going to promote this nationalism and American unity in three distinct ways. First, through the government and through the economy. So, first of all, we see the increase of the power of the national government over the states, which did lead to debates over how much power they should have, especially a little bit later on when Jackson is going to become the president. Second, through the economy, and this is going to encourage industry and transportation that's going to link the South, North, and the West into one collective economy. Now, this is done in starting in 1816 by a congressman named Henry Clay, who's going to be in government for a long time, all the way from uh, really about this time until just about uh, 1850 or so. And he's going to be an incredibly important person during this time. He becomes really the leader of one of the the next political parties that we're going to talk about. Uh, he's the creator of several major compromises. He's a very, very important person. So make sure that you know his and recognize his name and all of his different accomplishments. So what he comes up with is he comes up with this concept called the American system, this linking. All right? And so it was going to have several different parts. The first part was to create a second bank of the United States. The first bank of the United States, which had been created under Hamilton's financial plan in 1793, the charter for that had expired. And the entire concept of a national bank was the ability to not only store U.S. funds uh, from, you know, uh, for instance, from land sales and the collection of tariffs, but also they could loan it out to individual banks uh, to uh, to other uh, to other people, to government institutions. Um, so it was a way to kind of facilitate the flow of money throughout the U.S. economy. Today we have a national bank. Uh, it's called the Federal Reserve System. And it helps to regulate the flow of money uh, in the economy. Though our current national bank, the Fed, is much more powerful than the second bank of the United States ever was. The next part of Henry Clay's American system was to create a tariff. This would tax foreign imports, making foreign products more expensive and thus make the American uh, products that were um, made oftentimes in a more expensive fashion here uh, would make them you know, economically competitive with those foreign products and it would encourage manufacturing. And then thirdly, was the improved transportation. And this is probably the most significant and well-known part of Henry Clay's American system. 
was a series of roads and canals that would help to link the country. And so what this would end up doing is this would help to create a, um, this national market economy. Now, well, we're going to talk about this market revolution more in depth later in the unit. Uh, and this is just a preview to really help us understand the importance of Henry Clay's American system. The emphasis here is on the politics of the era, which should help you understand how the national government promoted a national market economy that by the 1810s had emerged as a strong regional economies due to new technological innovations. Again, we'll discuss these details in the next section of notes. Now, just to kind of really help us understand just in general though, in the South, we've got Southern cotton was used in Northern tax, uh, textile factories. Uh, Northern factories are making manufactured goods that are sold throughout the country. Western farms are raising livestock and grains that are, are feeding the nation. Now, the third way, the third way that Monroe is going to help uh, promote nationalism is through foreign policy. Uh, expanding America's borders and increasing America's role in world affairs made us a stronger nation during his era of good feelings. Now, after the War of 1812, Americans were moving west very fast. By 1840, nearly one out of every three Americans lived in the West. And this led to the addition of many, many new states. Uh, during our second unit, we learned about the one success of the Articles of Confederation, which was the Northwest Ordinance and the Land Ordinance of 1785 and 87, respectively, uh, which outlined the ways by which new states would be added. And that's when you hit a certain population number it's at 60,000, you could apply for statehood. And so, for instance, you see Indiana, Illinois, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana are all becoming states between 1812 and 1819. And this just kind of goes to um, show us how fast these, uh, this Western expansion of the population. A major theme during this, or in the first really 150 years of American history, um, is, is progressing. And this led to of the need to settle America's national borders. So that then leads us into key idea number two. The US government sought to influence control over the Western Hemisphere through a variety of means, including military actions, American Indian removal, which we'll talk in detail about in a later video, and diplomatic efforts such as the Monroe Doctrine. So this Western expansion is gonna to lead to our need to uh, settle America's borders. And so Monroe and his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, is going to use American foreign policy to both promote nationalism and territorial expansion. And to settle those borders, we do a few things. In 1818, the United States and Britain are going to agree to establish Canadian border at the 49th parallel, which is the long straight uh, border between the U.S. and Canada, where we have, uh, where we have it at now. And then again, the next year in 1819, the U.S. is going to gain Florida from Spain with an agreement that's called the adams onis Treaty, which uh, gives us the, country, the uh, state of Florida. Now, in addition to this, we also try and gain more influence in the Western Hemisphere. Now, the context of this attempt is when many of these Latin American nations were gaining their independence. And we can also hopefully remember back from Unit 2 where these Latin American nations had been influenced by the American Revolution in, in places like Brazil and Chile and Colombia, um, Mexico. They're all starting to gain their independence. Haiti, um, you know, inspired by the ideas of the American Revolution. And we wanted to support these new republics. In part, there's two reasons. One, for uh, the idea that we would then, if we could support them, we would have influence over them that would help our economy, our political position, our, 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 uh, our kind of rank in the world, uh, if you want to kind of think about it like that. And so, um, and we also want to try and keep European powers out. We were, we were very nervous about European powers establishing control and colonizing in Latin America. We wanted to have the opportunity to do that. And so in 1823, we're going to issue what's called the Monroe Doctrine. Uh, it's really actually written by John Quincy Adams, who's the Secretary of State. They're in charge of foreign affairs. Uh, but it's issued during Monroe's presidency, so he gets the credit for it. 
and it's going to warn European nations that the U.S. would protect the Western Hemisphere and that the U.S. would not still interfere with Europe. And in a way, you can kind of think of this as an extension of the Washington's farewell address, this idea that we are claiming the Western Hemisphere. You see kind of in the picture on the right-hand side, Uncle Sam putting his hat down on Latin America like we're claiming it. But it's this idea that this is our side of the world, and the Europeans pictured in the upper right-hand corner of that cartoon, that's, that's their side. We're, we're going to let them have that side. This is our side. Now, most European countries didn't kind of laugh this off that we were still a young nation. We had really, I mean, we just fought the War of 1812. We felt like we had won, but everybody else knew that we really hadn't. And so this was, uh, this was something they kind of laughed at us for, but this is going to set a precedent for how we're going to view the Western Hemisphere. And so when we become a strong nation, we'll use this precedent later on. This brings us then finally to key ideas three and four. So regional interests were going to tr oftentimes trump national concerns as a basis for political leaders' position on slavery and economic policy. And this um, issue of slavery, we're going to see congressional attempts at political compromise, specifically the Missouri Compromise. Notice it's listed by name. You have to know it then. Only temporarily stemming growing tensions between opponents and defenders of slavery. Once again, coming back to our essential question, which we had at the beginning of the lesson where we talked about different regional interests and obviously the idea not only uh, when we talk about economies the idea of slavery is a big part of that so once again we've been talking about how the u.s has been expanding westward all right this is idea of nationalism but we have growing problems between north and south called sectionalism and so Northerners and Southerners are just going to disagree over slavery, issues of taxation, roles of government, and only not North and South, but also rural and urban as well. And these disagreements dominate national politics between 1820 and 1860. Now, as we mentioned earlier in this video, people are moving West. By 1841, out of every three Americans are living in the West. And soon there's going to be people spilling over into what is going to become Missouri. Now, Missouri is going to apply to become a state, and we really see when this happens, sectionalism emerges. Northerners didn't want to see uh, states, uh, southern states increase their power in the national government, and this would happen in, in a few ways. Because of the three-fifths compromise, the South had more members in the House of Representatives. Uh, president Monroe was from Virginia, and so the South controlled the presidency as well. And if Missouri entered as a slave state, the South would have two more senators than the North. Now, to solve all this, in 1820, Henry Clay negotiated what was called the Missouri Compromise. It's sometimes also referred to as the Compromise of 1820. Now, this compromise would kind of help solve at least temporarily this issue, kind of a band-aid on the issue. Um, and the way it would work out is that uh, Missouri would become a slave state, but at the same time, Maine would be broken away from Massachusetts and become a free state. Now, this would go ahead and maintain the balance of free states and slave states in the U.S. Senate, which was an important thing. And on top of that, slavery would be outlawed in all Western territories above the 36 degree, 30 minute north latitude line, which is the bottom line of Missouri. The idea behind this is that in the future, any state that would come in above the line would automatically become free. Any state below the line would become automatically slave, and they would come in in pairs for at least the time being until the next big disagreement broke out. But we'll talk about that disagreement another time. So just to reiterate, during this time period, during the presidency of Monroe, it was an era what we call of good feeling with only one political party. But that doesn't mean it wasn't an era, era without political debate, as the U.S. attempted to develop a national economy that linked regions together, while at the same time you know, attempted to assert its, um, its dominance in the Western Hemisphere, but still struggled with the issues of slavery and sectionalism. So, until next time, go Pack!